Let me just read those last two, two verses that, uh, of the passage that we read. Verse 38, Romans 8, 8 says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Does the truth of that thrill your heart this morning? Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ. We come to the, the fifth of the doctrines of grace. We've reached the P of tulip, which is the flower of the Reformation. And the P, of course, we know stands for the perseverance of the saints. We all want assurance of our salvation. Not one of us would say, no, that doesn't bother me. We all want to have that assurance in our hearts. We all know we are, but we want to sense the witness of the Holy Spirit within us, telling us that we are children of God. That's what Romans 8, 17 speaks of. The, the inner witness of the Spirit saying to you and to me, you are a child of God. We all want that. Now, if someone was to ask us this morning, do you believe that you are heaven bound. The Christians in here would gladly stand and declare, yes, we are heaven bound. We are going home to glory. But the further question that would arise is this. What do you base that on? What do you base your answer on? Yes, we're going home to glory. On what foundation? You see, the belief that we have in our hearts as Christians that we cannot lose our salvation, that we are once called to be children of God, can never be come again the children of the devil. Understanding that is wonderful and it sets us up and it gives us strength. And it's true. It's a correct belief. But what does it rest on? And the answer? It rests on the doctrines of grace. We know we're going home to glory because of the doctrines of grace. Because of the biblical gospel of God. We are ruined sinners, unconditionally chosen. Given to Christ who died for us. Irresistibly called into that salvation. And it's all by the grace of Almighty God. And that from before the foundation of the world. That's our assurance this morning. I know that nothing can separate me. You know that nothing can separate you. If you're a Christian, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And one day we will stand before him. Not to be condemned, but to be welcomed home. Hallelujah. Guaranteed. And the doctrines of grace are the foundation stones upon which we build 
our belief. But this last doctrine, the perseverance of the saints, that is an expression of the security that we have in Christ Jesus. Perseverance of the saints expresses the reality that we are going home to glory. It's a witness to the fact that we are heaven bound. Because everyone that is heaven bound perseveres until heaven. Hallelujah. Everyone who perseveres until heaven is heaven bound. We persevere because we belong to Almighty God. Oh, the doctrines of grace are wonderfully, wonderfully true. So let's briefly look at this doctrine of, or this message around it. You and I need to persevere. No believer, no true Christian would deny that the Bible teaches that we need to persevere. We need to persevere in our Christian lives. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, the Lord says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. And the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1.23 speaks of continuing in the faith, grounded and settled. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. We have to continue in the faith, grounded and settled. And then Apostle John, the Apostle John in 1 John 2, 24, he says that if that which ye have heard from the beginning, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So we, we don't deny as Christians that the Bible teaches that we need to persevere in our faith. The Christian life is not about coming to Christ, making a profession of faith, and then going and doing whatever you want and never coming back again and just knowing that, well, I came to Jesus once in 1973. I know that no matter what happens now, I'm going to be in glory. Do you think so? We need to persevere. There is a need for us to continue it's not about a one-time profession. And so we accept that right at the beginning. We all accept as Christians there is a need for perseverance. The problem is that some who claim to be Christian place the power of perseverance completely and totally in the will of man. So I'm going to become unfriendly. Hopefully not nasty. Roman Catholicism teaches that there is a need for the grace of God in order to be saved. We grant them that truth. That is what they teach. However, and sadly, Roman Catholicism also teaches that to maintain the state of grace depends upon the believer's ongoing good works. That's the error. That the believer must cooperate with God's grace 
to remain in the state of grace. James chapter 2 and verse 20 is sometimes used to uh, support that. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead, verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, speaking of Abraham. And that would suggest, from their perspective, their point of view, that in order to be saved, you need to have good works as well as grace. And you need to cooperate. And the fact of the matter is, that's wrong. James isn't teaching that at all. Oh, hallelujah. James isn't teaching that your good works contribute along with the grace of God to salvation. But James is teaching that your good works flow out of your salvation by the grace of God. They don't lead to or keep you saved. They are proof that you've already been saved by the grace of God. So if there's no good works in a Protestant's life, the question is asked, are they saved? But that's a different, a different angle altogether. So the other lot I'm going to annoy are the, are the Ar Arminians. Arminianism teaches that there is the possibility of genuine, lasting faith. But it also teaches that believers can ultimately lose that faith if they rebel persistently against God. They agree that no man can pluck you out of the hand of Jesus Christ. But they say you can take yourself out of the hand of Jesus Christ if you don't keep up the good works. If you don't keep living properly. And so both Arminianism and Roman Catholicism emphasize the central importance of the human will in salvation. Central importance. Cooperating with the grace of God. Therefore, both Roman Catholicism and Arminianism teach the same thing. Salvation by good works. Hallelujah. We don't believe that in this church. We don't believe that we chose to be saved, that we decided for Jesus. Because if we believe that we decided for Jesus, then Arminianism is right in that we can also decide not to follow Jesus. That is not biblical. Hallelujah. We've seen that in the doctrines of grace. The biblical reality is that you are a Christian because God made you a Christian. You believe in Jesus because God gave you the faith. Praise the Lord. And God won't take that away. So both Arminianism and Roman Catholicism leave the believer with absolutely no assurance of salvation whatsoever. If you need to keep up your effort in order to stay saved, then my, oh my, my heart breaks for you. Because you will never know. You will never know assurance. Have you done enough? Have you done enough? The sweat, the spiritual sweat is pouring out of you. You don't have any more energy. You've been working so hard to maintain the smile of God upon you. 
and you've been doing it for years and years and years and you've been as diligent and as conscientious as you possibly could be and still the question comes to you but have you done enough whether you're a Roman Catholic or whether you believe in free will salvation that's the question have you kept it up I've tried uh, but have you done it doesn't matter how hard we try doesn't matter what we seek to do hallelujah it doesn't matter we would never ever do enough there isn't a there isn't a single person who believes in having to cooperate with the grace of God to stay saved there isn't a single one of them that has assurance today but we want assurance we want to know that we're going home to glory hallelujah Zion Baptist Church we know we're going home to glory hallelujah there's not a believer in this church this morning who who knows the doctrines of grace who can ever say there's a doubt about it no there is no doubt about it hallelujah chosen Christ died for you you were called into that salvation by irresistible grace you are going home to glory you have assurance If you think about it how can there be assurance in these other systems how can there be assurance that you would ever reach when it all boils down to the power and the strength of your free will what's your will like well let me say let me tell you maybe 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 you get this If you're waiting for me to stop eating Cadbury's fruit and nut by my own free will, it will never happen, let me tell you. And you've got something in your life much more serious than chocolate that you have struggled with since you've become a Christian might be your attitude might be your temper whatever it may be you've struggled with that aren't you glad this morning that your salvation has got nothing to do with your free will with the strength of your will if you cannot even put a chocolate bar down who do you think you are that you can live life to please almighty God and make it sure in your strength that you're going home to glory forget it you've already blown it because if you're thinking about something that plagues you you know that over the peace you've fallen foul of that then the very first time you fell foul of it too late you've broken it gone hallelujah hallelujah that's false teaching that says you need to cooperate with God's grace in order to stay saved in order to stay in a state of grace no man can pluck you out of the hand of Christ that's true and it includes you and it includes me if no man can pluck me out of the hand of Christ I cannot do it he will not allow it praise the Lord if you're trusting your flesh it will always plunge you into uncertainty it will leave you there you will be unsure because you've blown it 
but then you've tried hard again and then you've blown it. And then you've tried hard again and then you've blown it. Forget trying hard again. The first time was enough. The psalmist says, my flesh and my heart faileth. There is no ability in any one of us to keep going in the Christian life. And so the, the hymn writer wrote when writing, stand up, stand up for Jesus, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. But you see, that's not what we believe. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. We believe in the perseverance of the saints. From a biblical perspective, the Bible says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know the love of God? Have you experienced the saving love of Almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ? Then you cannot be separated from that love. It will not happen, for it cannot happen. Are you saved? Then you're saved. But you need to persevere. The biblical doctrine, you see, of perseverance expresses the assurance that we have in the other doctrines of grace. I will persevere to the end because God chose me. I will persevere to the end because God gave me to Christ who died for me. I will persevere to the end because God called me by irresistible grace into the reality of that salvation. I will persevere to the end. Do you believe that? Regardless of your struggles, regardless of your difficulties, regardless of your wanderings, regardless of your failures, if the love of Almighty God in Christ Jesus drew you to Calvary and washed you in the blood of the Lamb, your failures cannot mean that you are now separated from God. Hallelujah. Your failures mean that you need to get back on your knees before God, deal with the situation, and move on. Hallelujah. Continuing the journey home to glory. Are you on the journey home to glory? Well, if you're a Christian, you better believe it. How much, how many bruises do you have on your spiritual bruises on your body? Do you know one of the things that used to, I hated most, was when I skint my knee and the scab would grow over. And then you just knew that what would happen the next time you fell is that you'd take the scab right off and there you go, back to the beginning. How many, how many have you got on your body today, spiritually speaking? Do you know something? Painful though it is, even when you knock off that scab, in other words, even when you fall and you bump yourself in exactly the same way and in the same place as you always seem to do, you will never be separated from the love of God that is in Christ. Christ Jesus. Never. Complete assurance. And the reason that we can be completely secure in this, 
The reason that we, I can say this this morning and we can believe it as a body is because it is built upon a completely different foundation altogether. That our, sen our sense of security and assurance is not at all to do with how well we live our Christian lives. Although we should be seeking to live our Christian lives as best we can. But our salvation is not based on that. Our security in our salvation is based entirely upon the love of Almighty God from before the foundation of the world. That's the foundation of our security. It's got nothing to do with men or man or the instability of our best efforts. Did you know that your best efforts for Christ are in unstable? Did you know that your best efforts are unsure? Or as the Bible puts them, filthy rags. All your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The only righteousness that matters is the righteousness of Christ that is given to every single person that God chose before the foundation of the world. To every single person that God gave to Jesus Christ. Every single person for whom Christ died. Every single person that God called. For all of those And how wonderful is it that we can sit in this church this morning and we can just revel in the grace of God. Reveling in the grace of God is not taking the grace of God for granted or treating it lightly. It's treating it biblically when we see that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. I wonder this morning, are you as persuaded as the Apostle Paul? Well, if you believe the gospel that the Apostle Paul preached, if you hold to the truths that, that thrilled the heart of the Apostle Paul, then nothing can separate us and we are fully persuaded this morning. So what, what's your assurance based on? The word of God, the doctrines of grace, the biblical gospel that tells me I'm going home and there's nothing anyone can do. So just let me underline before we go any further that there's not one of us in here or anywhere else that can do anything about getting saved. God is the decider in the matters of salvation, as he is in everything else. God is sovereign. So do you just want to be excited a minute? Read this. Romans 9.16 so then, it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. That's what it's all about. And we thank him for it. Unable to come to Christ. If man can't come to Christ, God must do it. God must do it. And because of the same fleshly weakness, man cannot keep himself in Christ. Therefore, God must do it. And we are thankful today in this place that we know that God does it. We know that God keeps us. He who began a good work will carry it on to completion.
So the assurance that we find, we find in the doctrines of grace, and it's expressed in this beautiful doctrine of perseverance. The doctrine that says we will. But you still haven't touched it properly. The foundation of Paul's confidence in those late verses in Romans 8. The confidence that his salvation is assured is the sovereign purpose and power of Almighty God. Look at Romans 8 and verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's a beautiful, beautiful text. This is often called the golden chain of salvation, but it's a it's a glorious chain of assurance that is found in this verse. This is a chain of assurance of our salvation. You see, it begins with those whom he did predestinate. Those whom he did predestinate. Unconditional election. What about those that were unconditionally chosen? Those who have been predestinated? Well, we get thrilled as we go on through the verse, don't we? Because those whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Unconditional election, irresistible grace. Called irresistibly to Jesus Christ. Do you get it? Those he's chosen, he calls. Those he's predestinated, he calls. And those he called, he justified. Who are justified? Those he calls. Limited atonement. Jesus died for the chosen of God. Do you see the doctrines of grace in this verse? Unconditionally elected, called irresistibly, justified through the limited atonement of Jesus Christ, and then glorified. That's perseverance. Guaranteed. Perseverance of the saint, guaranteed. Because you look at the tense of the, the, the words and, and, and you know this, but we'll do it. Predestinated, past tense. Called, past tense. Justified, Past tense, glorified, past tense, but it hasn't happened yet. Not in our experience. In our experience, we are not yet glorified, but in the mind and heart of Almighty God, oh, yes, we are. There is perseverance of the saints, right there. And it's guaranteed in the heart and mind of God. Guaranteed in the purposes of God. Believer, we're going home to glory. There is nothing that can be done to change it. The very moment God set his love upon us in eternity past, 
our perseverance into eternity future was guaranteed. From election to glory. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil or from the evil one. You see how the preservation of the saints now supersedes the perseverance of the saints. We are to persevere in our salvation, in our walk of faith. But the only reason that we are able to persevere in our walk of faith is because Almighty God is preserving us every step of the way. Therefore, nothing that we do can cause God to lose grip of us. He's decided that we are already decided that, that we will be with him in glory. And so, in answer to the prayer of Jesus, who prayed that God would keep us from the evil one, God keeps us from the evil one. Because as I said last week, he will not be deprived of one, not one of his children. We will all be with him in glory. What a wonderful saviour. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, his desire in his heart is that God would establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints, that God would establish a heart, that God would make your heart blameless, <laughs> that God would make your heart holy. You see, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul takes the responsibility away from you. And says, if you are to be established in the faith and find yourself in glory one day, then that is the work of Almighty God. And every time you trip up, he has committed himself to pick you up. Every time you get it wrong, he has committed himself to remind you and show you the right way and deal with your sin with you. How many, time, how many times have you gotten it wrong, brother or sister? Don't you have a patient father? Isn't your father patient beyond anything that you could imagine? When he sees you on the floor again, and he comes to you, and he picks you up again. The guarantee is that he will never cease picking you up or me up until we get home to glory. And there will be no further need of God to pick us up. Your heart and mine must be to live a holy life. It must be to live appropriately for God. That our lives would be filled with that which pleases him and glorifies him. But not one of us in here as Christians today would genuinely suggest that we've come anywhere near it. But every one of us as Christians today can testify to the hand of our Father picking us up to make sure we persevere to the end. It's not really perseverance. 
It's preservation. You and I are being preserved all the way home to glory, Christian. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful truth it is. Here's the thing. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Get there eventually. 1 Peter chapter 4. Chapter 1, I beg your pardon, verses 4 and 5. This is where the apostle is speaking about what's waiting for us in heaven. He says that there is an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now that's the, the remarkable reality, is that your inheritance, Christian, and mine, has already been prepared. It's there waiting for us. Not in some general sense, but your inheritance, my inheritance. It's there waiting for us. And it is incorruptible, undefiled. It doesn't fade away. In other words, by the power of Almighty God, your inheritance is being preserved for you. But look at the next verse. For you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Not only is our inheritance being kept by the power of God for us, but we are being kept by the power of God for it. Hallelujah. Do you see the guarantee? There is no possibility that you and I, believer, will not get home to enjoy our inheritance. God's keeping it and God's keeping us. And God's got the two of them in, two in mind that we will be brought into the reality of that inheritance. And he does everything required to keep us for our inheritance. Perseverance, preservation. Oh, we thank God for the doctrines of grace. We thank God today that we could do nothing, so he did it. We thank God that we can do nothing, so he does it. We thank God that we will never be able to do anything, so he has committed to always do what needs to be done. So that day will come when every believer in here will stand with all the believers who have gone before. And those who will come after us if Christ doesn't return. And we will receive our inheritance. Because perseverance of the saints is God's work of preservation. Remember Peter in Luke chapter 22. Here's Peter, messed it up. Or about to mess it up, rather. All in the knowledge of Christ. Peter, one of his sheep, is about to mess it up. And Jesus knew. And in Luke 22, verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not. What is true of Simon Peter is true of every single believer in this church this morning. Even before we fail, Jesus gives the promise, I have prayed for you so that your fall, your stumble, will not destroy your faith. 
Me? He would do that for me? So I want to say this with as much conviction as I can muster. You who are bruised head to foot. The prayer of Jesus for you means that you come back into the fold and make it home to glory. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And so we can say that we are persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fact, 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 because Jesus prayed for us. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for these doctrines of grace. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful flower of the Reformation, this wonderful tulip that the, the, the beauty of it has touched the ministries of so many and the lives of so many men. Luther, Calvin, the Puritans, the great Jonathan Edwards, John Knox, Spurgeon, Lloyd-Jones, and so many others, Samuel Rutherford. Andrew Bonner. John Newton. Oh, Father, how we thank you. And how we thank you that even today, there are those whose lives and ministries are touched and flavored by these doctrines. MacArthur, Piper, jo uh, Paul Washer, and many, many more. It's our prayer today, Father God, as we conclude this series on the wonderful doctrines of grace, that they would forever flourish that the tulip would forever be seen in the ministries and lives of your people because we long to bring glory to your great and awesome name. Father, we want to thank you this morning for this. Thank you for doing it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.